Hello everybody, welcome back to Voice for Men India. Joining with us today is Dr. Edmund Fernandez. He's a CEO for CHD Group and also a practicing physician in India. Uh, Dr. Edmund is joining us today amidst a lot of panic which is happening uh, currently, especially in our country where we are witnessing a lot of young deaths being reported, uh, mainly because of heart attacks. Uh, hello, Dr. Edmund. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Adnaz. Good to be here. And congratulations on all the work that you're doing. Happy to have this interaction with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dr. Fernandez, one of your tweet has gone super viral and it has been widely covered, uh, you know, by a lot of media, uh, especially on, you know, the topic of heart attacks. So I'll just come to that in a bit. But before we begin, I want you to address, uh, you know, to a larger audience, uh, you know, is there a need to panic? Is there, you know, too much of social media reports which are coming out or was this also happening before and now it's, you know, just because of a lot of reporting that's happening, we are getting to see more number of people die. What is your take on this? I think, uh, I mean, heart attacks have been historically the way uh, um, we meet a certain des destination of a human journey. But having said that, with, with an age of information overload, with media trying to hype a lot of things, uh, the conversations have gotten stronger of why heart attacks are skyrocketing or why is it happening in youngsters. I mean, I remember two years ago in the middle of the lockdown, we, we never used to see so many cases or patients wouldn't turn up at emergencies other than COVID kind of cases. And now suddenly that everything is open up, life is normalized, all kind of things are trying to shape up. So heart in heart, my submission here would be that it's not heart attack occurring in youngsters, but it has a lot of things to do with comorbid conditions, risk factors, the stress involved, urbanization, what people do in terms of uh, consumption of drugs, alcohol, smoking, sedentary lifestyles. So all of these things uh, had in a way other than the genetic makeup of a person uh, to build that kind of risk factors that leads to cardiac arrest. But, but my point is, uh, Dr. Fernandez, that obviously, you know, we knew that these things are happening. But, you know, somehow every day we are getting to hear a lot of cases you know where a lot of young people are dying so has the pattern changed because earlier this pattern was largely seen in you know uh, elderly people or maybe people who have crossed 50 or 60 but now we are hearing you know people uh, in 20s or some uh, the, like recently there was a case of somebody dying at 18 as well so is that worrying or is does the, has this already been existing in the past as well no, it's not worrying, but at the same time, the approach of youngsters today definitely needs a course correction. Now, with regard to one person dying out of the many millions that we see, is like the probability of an airplane crashing at a particular airport. So, of course, why it's happening or uh, what, what are the factors leading to the cause of death of that one person? calls for a greater conversation. We need to go into the history of it. We need to look into the genetic makeup of the individual, whether there have been morbid conditions that have influenced that outcome. But this is not commonly seen like one out of two or one out of three cases where you see a heart attack. That's not the case. But at the same time, a lot of youngsters today spend time on mobile phones, laptops. They have immense amount of stress. Whether you, you ask a school kid, the school child is also stressed. Exams are a year for a war. You ask a college going kid, they are preparing for entrance exams. They are stressed. You ask people working, irrespective of where they are working, what they are doing, they are stressed. You look at family situations, people are stressed. 
so stress is a very very strong contributor to the risk factors of cardiovascular diseases and not just cardiovascular diseases but also the brothers and sisters of cardiology wherein you have diabetes you have kidney issues you have lung issues all of that add in concert to the outcome per se additionally people also don't walk or exercise the consumption of food they have is often junk they don't drink water to that effect climate change is another issue where the climate scientists and um, public health folks are trying to research on different parameters of how heat induced stroke and heat uh, per se is a contributor to cardiovascular issues so uh, moving forward i think as a nation or as a region we need to look at policy level issues pertaining to not just cardiovascular diseases but a holistic form of human life where happiness and sorrows are assessed within the bandwidth of medicine oh uh, doctor you said that we should have a good lifestyle and you know by that you are suggesting that we should be exercising daily uh now that also draws my attention to a lot of cases which have come up in the recent past where deaths have occurred uh, you know amongst very physically fit people and some of them actually losing their life while working out at the gym what do you have to say to that oh uh, yes there have been cases reported which have read in the popular press about gym induced deaths but the point here is uh, physical fitness is one component and excessive chronic gymming can also lead to uh, what you say electrical disturbances within the heart and this could probably lead to a trigger of uh, cardiac arrest um in addition to that what the person consumes um in terms of protein or in terms of substances advised in the gym without a pre cardiac evaluation without interim evaluation is all very questionable this points out to the fact that should all gyms mandatorily go through a pre cardiac evaluation for anybody enrolling at the gym probably it could lead to a policy intervention but uh, i mean any exercise in moderation is fine but any exercise that is being overdone over stretched uh, not just on the heart but it has a cumulative impact on the physique and the body as well so the this this definitely needs uh, some kind of uh, deeper research into evaluating why it's happening and probably it's also good material for the sports ministry to come up with policies that favor preventive health now i come to your tweet uh, you know where uh, and before i you know suggest anything i would like to make a disclaimer here that this is a very generic conversation that we are having and everybody is advised to take a proper medical advice before they go ahead and you know uh, actually follow any advice given on this program so dr edmund has you know kind of suggested that whenever there is a trigger for you know where you have pain in the chest or where you feel that perhaps the you know attack is going to trigger now uh, you must have an aspirin which is handy and which perhaps might help to you know kind of arrest that situation for that moment so i would like dr fernandez to guide us on this whether this should be like an sos whether it works for everybody or whether it's like you know try uh, if it uh, if it it, it, it succeeds it succeeds or you know you never know what would happen so the point pertaining to what i tweeted for the trending hashtag of heart attack is yes it would be ideal and life saving to pop a 300 mg aspirin but this is at the onset of a very severe chest pain that is radiating to the neck and left hand and the point here is not to just have the aspirin and relax 
this is to take the 300 mg orally with a glass of water and to immediately rush to the hospital what happens in this process is we would be buying time which eventually the patient will survive in addition to aspirin you can also have a sorbitrate 5 mg which is kept under the tongue that can be chewed and uh, kept sublingual so this is not the treatment this is just the immediate intervention to rush to the hospital so that the life can be saved and uh, obviously keeping a 300 mg aspirin available to you is is always favorable but in an instance if the heart attack is so very severe where there's already been 95 to 99% block then uh, i mean it's a matter of seconds or less than a minute that the patient has before the patient would collapse so it's it's not just the patient concerned who should uh, have the knowledge of this but as citizens and civilians interested in the process of preventive health and safety it's in the larger interest of everybody to understand that having this will only buy you time but immediate referral and further care is the mandate to be followed there is a question i want to ask you dr fernandez that many a times you know we kind of we ignore the symptoms we think it's more to do with gas or you know it's not really the chest pain or the arm pain that we are facing how would one really differentiate between the two i mean at times it's very different difficult to differentiate and the line would get blurred because when you have a uh, chest pain and you have a, a lot of people around you telling is nothing but gastritis we tend to be influenced by it so the best way to clear this doubt is to have a cardiac evaluation done once in 6 months if you're in the high risk categories or at least once a year once you cross the age of 40 uh, there's no harm in doing a cardiac evaluation it will give us parameters and indicators to say how well we're doing and that itself should serve as the bible for guiding us forward and do how we want to move or how we want to plan the rest of our preventive health um, processes so and of course i'm going to address the elephant in the room which everybody you know is thinking at the moment a lot of conspiracy theories going on of course i'm not going to add fuel to the fire because personally i believe that we should have a lot of faith in science because you can't question everything uh, but yes there is a lot of buzz going around whether this is or or due to vaccines or are these some kind of side effects due to the vaccines that the heart attacks are increasing i mean of course i've come across a lot of such theories that are being peddled that vaccine linkages with heart issues exist uh, but again it brings me back to the point that if there is an airplane crash um one in a million kind of situation then we need to choose here um, as to what is uh, effective what is more life saving and what can save geometric lives as with regard to um, vaccine induced cardiac deaths there is no direct evidence emerging from reasonable sources that yes there is direct uh, problems but to an extent the covid as a disease people having comorbid conditions like type 2 diabetes chronic kidney diseases chain smokers drugs who people who consume high end drugs and a lot of them this has been a risk factor and triggered so it's very easy to do all of that and to at the same time say you know i took a covid vaccine and this is what has happened it's it's like you cover up a lot of your um, dirty linen and try to shift the blame into something else saying that that's because of that i mean in in a popular parlance of how the present atmospheres are it it's very easy for people to say okay covid has been the cause for everything under the sun that's not true and neither has vaccine been i mean if you look at the vaccine statistics there are millions and millions of people who've taken the vaccine and to that proportion people who 
coming to the emergency room as a uh, patient of cardiac issues is not proportionate. So it would be very wrong to um, simply blame it on the vaccine, but at the same time, the risk factors, people who have been at high risk for cardiac issues would have emerged as probably front runners for uh, complications. So how, how do we sum it up, uh, Doctor? What are your three takeaways from this that you would like to give to our people? I mean, I would like to go back to grandmother's common sense today more than modern medicine uh, for a simple reason that people in the past or our ancestors or grandparents lived longer. And it's not that they, their life did not have stress. It's just that the nature of stress is different today from the nature of stress that used to be there many years ago. But stress is stress. So the simple basic activities to ensure physical activity of at least 30 to 45 minutes every day to understand or to reach a spiritual uh, journey in life that if you don't perform uh, or complete your task immediately, the worst that can happen is you'll be fired from your job. It's not the end of the world. So we need to reason out, we need to have certain lifestyle changes, we need to cut down on our activities on the cell phone, laptops, and if we think we can't, then at least that should be substituted by minimum 45 minutes of exercise. Uh, in terms of our food habits, we need to see how much of pizzas we want to eat, how much of alcohol we want to consume, how much of cigarettes we want to smoke. So these are definite indicators of alarm bells that we need to be cautious about. And uh, after all, in the end, it, it, it's your life. So, if, I mean, it reminds me a lot of a lot of doctors, uh, especially um, cancer surgeons who operate on uh, people who uh, smoke a lot and take off their tumor and then come out of the operation theater and again smoke two cigarettes and go back to the next operation. So in spite of knowing the risk factors, if we continue our life to be led the way it is, then um, then it, it's a conscious decision we make and we are, we are the sole owners of that uh, proprietorship of our life. So simple three points, physical exercise, moderating uh, our diet, and anything in excess, slow down. Absolutely. So on a lighter note, you know, you can say it's my body, my choice, but uh, get that discipline in your life and, you know, do everything what you want to, but in moderation. That's right. On that note, thank you very much, Dr. Fernandez, for joining us. And we'll keep troubling you more for some tips, uh, especially related to health of men. Thank you, Arnaz. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.